Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this afternoon's Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon for my discussion with Gabriella Wilkes, who lives and works in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm Marike Visser. I live in Suriname. Before we begin, I'd like to express huge thanks to the Catapult partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this series of salons happen. Thank you very much. Please feel free to ask your questions in the comments section during the talk, which we'll get to in the Q&A segment of this salon. And now I would like to welcome Gabrielle. Welcome, Gabrielle Wilkes. Hi. Hi. Welcome in the online studio. Thank you. I, uh, I'm going to introduce you shortly. Gabrielle Wilkes was born in St. Lucia, but raised in the land of her parents' birth, Trinidad and Tobago. She received her BFA in art with a concentration in metals from Ball State University, Indiana, in the USA, where she graduated magna cum laude amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. We will hear about that part later. <laughs> her thesis is about folklore in Trinidad and Tobago. From your artist statement, I take this quote. In this modern age, Western influences have overshadowed individual expressions of culture and identity. In my home country of Trinidad and Tobago, we rely on the oral tradition when it comes to folklore. Through many of these, though many of these stories are fading from our collective memory. My childhood was richly embellished by tales of mythical characters, but to today's children and even some of my peers have been deprived of that experience. The Caribbean is really a, a region of stories, many, many yeah, stories. Definitely. Yeah. How did you choose this subject? the folklore of Trinidad and Tobago for your thesis and for your body of work? Growing up, because both my parents are older than most of my friends' parents, uh, my dad used to tell us these stories and we had two children's books that talked about folklore and somebody actually painted my dad as one of the characters. So it was very much something that was normal for me and a lot of my friends, that wasn't necessarily the case for them. And I just knew that I had to do something that was quintessentially Trinidadian for my thesis. I knew I wanted it to be cultural. So I had considered doing traditional carnival characters because I had done a piece the year before on that, but it, it didn't feel as, as personal to me as the folklore did. And I knew I wanted to represent my family members as these characters so it, it just worked out better that yes. way. And I thought it would be very unique to in that setting. Yes. You gave your own uh, twist to it. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, we will look at some of the works. So we'll dive right in. And uh, then we'll get a better idea what you're what you're talking about. This is one of the works uh, which uh, was part of the uh, final exam. This uh, was before my final. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, yeah. Just before, it was like one of the last things I worked on before my thesis. So this was the traditional carnival character one, inspired one. So it's the Dame Lorraine, which is a character I had played when I used to do Kitty's Carnival. So it it was a personal experience. And I I always work on something that, that I know in some way I've lived it in some way. I can't really work on something. I can't make 
if it's not something that I have had some experience in. So I wanted to do this fan of traditional carnival character, Gramlarine. And it's it has a kind of story hidden in it so that when it's closed, you see the top right picture represents the slaves mocking the planters in their own celebration. And then the planters beneath, they're doing, they're, they're at a ball. And that that was the, the character herself. She She's a very exaggerated character to mock the attire that a planter's wife would be seen wearing. So really padded bust and lots of padding in the, the butt too. So I was trying to hide that story in the fan. So yes. when it's open, it just looks like a pretty hand fan, but it has this secret story to it. And this is all metal. Yes, this is all hand pierced metal. Okay. And when it's closed, then you see both sides of the story. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, for me, Carnival is not, not very familiar. Um, in Suriname, we don't have Carnival. Uh, so we are not familiar with um, the, the uh, pers uh, personalities you are talking about. Mm -hmm. like the Demerine. Um yeah. and I you told me a lot about it which I found very fascinating um met the, the those many stories of the Caribbean again yeah. and um you told me that as a kid as a small uh, girl you used to play kiddies carnival I but when did. you grew up when you became a teenager you didn't participate anymore. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of an introvert and I can be a little antisocial. So carnival is something that is very difficult for me personally because it's a lot of people, it's a lot of a lot of sounds, a lot of stimulation from all sides, and it's it's just not <laughs> I want I want to play now. Now that I'm an adult, I I want to give it a chance, and that only that only came to me while I was away from home. So it was this thing that is very Trinidadian, and everybody's doing it. And while I was away, that was when I craved I craved <laughs> anything that was very Trinidadian. Uh, so the music, everything that I may not have normally done, I wanted it now. I was just I needed it. <laughs> And now you're home and now COVID. <laughs> my, I might change my mind again. <laughs> yeah, we, but, we'll see. but who, who knows? We'll see. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's and, uh, virtual carnival in 2021. So I guess that's yes. a good way to ease myself into it. But for somebody who didn't want to um, play uh, carnival, um, You craved it, and then you decided to 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 work with folklore. Yeah. Okay. And um, this is one of the uh, pieces. Then can we see the next one, Duen? Yes. Yeah. Can so you? The Dwen is a folklore character that is actually a baby. It's it's the spirit of a of a, a lost child. And they they're characterized by their lack of facial features. They they have no genitals and their feet are backwards because they're kind of like spirits trapped in limbo. But part of the thing, aside from that, because I feel like when people think of some of our characters, there's, there's this idea that they're, they're kind of, you know, they're creepy and they're a bit malicious and their intentions aren't necessarily pure. But because of how I was trying to interpret it for my thesis, I wanted these characters to become protectors of our culture. So I didn't, I didn't want to focus on the negative sides of them. 
Mm-hmm. So the twins are described as very playful. So because it's a baby and it's playful to me, doing a rattle made sense. But I wanted it. I wanted it to look like something that has been long, long lost, abandoned. For you know, it's being overgrown. So it it, it even it makes noise. That was an important part of it for me too. Okay. Not that I have a recording, but they really are beads in it so that you can shake it and it makes noise just like an old barato or... And do you see the several pieces you made uh, as a whole or do you see them as separate artworks? I do I do see them as a whole just because I wanted all the characters to be together so I kept trying to figure out how can I unify these five characters that they're very different so what do I do in my, my visual language that can have this common thread going throughout, but at the same time still still capture the sense that they are they're very different from each other. So I had considered doing mixed media, but then I felt like no working in metals is going to help be that that commonality too. Mm-hmm. What kind of mixed media? I, the only thing I really did in the end was some glass, but unfortunately those pieces weren't included in my pieces because of circumstances. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and you mentioned also that you uh, uh, wanted to connect your family members to the works. Yeah. And how how do you see that? That was actually another aspect that <laughs> because of the circumstances surrounding how my my time at school ended, I could not include it in my show, but I had been working on these pieces because I didn't just want five 3D pieces. I felt, to me that felt like it was too little for a thesis mm-hmm. show. I felt somewhere in my head I numbers were very important to me even yes. if it wasn't actually I felt like you have to have at least 10. And so I was doing 2D work to complement the 3D pieces because I wanted this story to kind of be almost explicitly written or drawn out. So I had these plates that I was doing um, in Taglio prints with so that I could have the character drawn and they, for the characters I was using, my family members as as the models for my drawings so so all of that was ultimately omitted from my thesis but oh but i still have the i still have the components for it because i i mean i want to finish the work the way i envisioned it outside of the thesis it's yes it's what you had in mind and yeah it was very important to me at the time especially considering my audience because it's americans and this is entirely foreign to them i felt on some level that maybe i needed to spell things out just to to help clarify things along the way because i wasn't sure how much i wanted to leave it to interpretation so there was that element i uh before we go on to the next one you mentioned something and I, I want to uh, talk about that. You said something very interesting in one of our previous conversations that um, you you didn't encounter any negativity, but yeah. you encountered a lot of positivity and almost in a way that it became a problem because people were so careful uh, that they uh, found it hard to be very critical. Mm -hmm. And you said, over there I was the other and people couldn't relate to what I was uh, talking about. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, I could count on one hand how many other Caribbean international students there were mm-hmm. at that school, and they were all older than me. 
arts and none of them were in the school of arts so nine times out of ten i was the only person of color in a classroom in in the school of arts specifically mm -hmm. and i think as a result people because nobody was outright racist so there was always this i was always comfortable but there was this sense that when we had critiques the way other people might, you know, they might really delve into somebody else's work and they want to, they want to pull it apart. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I felt like there was this, there was this fear about doing that to mine because my work yeah. was almost always cultural or, you know, it was related to ethnicity and stuff like that. So them not having the experiences that I had and their fear of, of saying something that could possibly be construed as racist, it would sometimes lead to me not having the kind of full critique. And I am very self-critical, so I could have a long list of things in my head that I thought was wrong about mm -hmm. what I did. And my teacher used to have to tell me every single critique, she'd be like, we do not self-critique, we do not self-critique, because once I start talking about my pieces, my autopilot is to to start saying everything that I think is wrong with it. Oh. And she would always put a pin in that, but I wouldn't necessarily get that kind of feedback that I expected from others. And so it was always almost like too positive. I felt like and, they and, to wrong. And where did, did you get your feedback then? My family would give me a lot of feedback. And I, I mean, the faculty, the faculty was always pretty good about mm -hmm. that but i may not get it from my peers and i could get it from my friends because they know that i'm not going to take it the wrong way so they're comfortable okay. to to say it to me but in a critique setting unless my friend is in the critique and she's the one saying it i might not get you know i really might not get much no yeah. because if you if you are creating I think it's 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 almost crucial to have feedback. Yeah, and that's what I was yeah. used to in secondary school. I mean, yeah, I would I would get the full brunt of of the feedback. There's mm -hmm. there's no you know, nobody's holding their punches or anything, and I would sometimes feel like that was what was happening. Like yeah. somebody's put on the the kidney gloves or something, and they're scared to tell me what might be wrong or if I'm not conveying what I think I'm conveying. Or if they are not scared, then maybe they just don't understand oh, yeah. your, your and cultural I mean, background and they yeah. don't understand what your uh, thinking is. Yeah, what, and I, I would have taken that if somebody just said, I don't see what you're saying from what you've made. I, mm -hmm. That would have been better to me than, than just saying I like it or mm -hmm. not saying anything. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, slide. Um, Mama Dlo. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, a pain in the uh, butt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It, this piece was the only one from my thesis that took me about a year to make. Wow. I, I took a really long time because I didn't know how I was making it. I kept changing my mind along the way. I, I, I had to adapt a lot to this one. And it was a new technique for me. So it, it's Viking knits, which is weaving with metal wire, really, really thin wire. So it's kind of like thread. Mm -hmm. And I had done that at first, but the knit by itself is it's kind of weak, it's very flexible, so you could just mess up the shape completely with a pass of the hand. So I decided to string beads onto it. There's over 10,000 beads on that because wow. the beads were the beads were doing two things. It was reinforcing the knit and it was making the pattern. But the snake, because Mama Drew is a snake woman. Mm -hmm. So I the pattern that I had picked the snake that I chose is one that's actually endemic to Trinidad because I thought that was just a nice little secret to have hidden in there. What snake is it? I can't remember the name. 
I'm not a fan of snakes, so it was already no. a miracle. Good <laughs> <Me either>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had I had snake skin that people had given to me and I thought that I was going to work with it and then I was just like this crawls my blood every time I touch it so maybe not no maybe in the future I still have it so yeah maybe in the future okay and then there were uh, uh, other works which we we won't show but um, they are part of the body of work. And that was what you um, graduated with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want, um, uh, how, how did you experience to be a, away from home? I am really close with my family. So yes. that was always the biggest struggle for me was being apart because my mom used to joke when I was younger that I think I'm her shadow or something because I, I would cling to her everywhere she goes I follow so and and I didn't think I was going to go away to study so it was a big change but the opportunity came and it was kind of like am I really gonna pass this up you know I'm gonna go somewhere new and go to a program that is bigger than anything that I could have gone to if I stayed home and all the equipment that they had. So circumstances, just things fell into place. So I was able to go away. I went as a sculpture major. I changed my mind within, I think, a year, if so much. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I got recruited to the metals program and I, I had enjoyed the class so much. I was just like, yep, this, this is the one I think. <laughs> And they want me, so I'm going to just go where they want me. <laughs> and what do you like about metal? I am a clumsy person, so something that's not going to break immediately when I'm handling it is nice for one. Okay. And it, this was one of the classes I took later on, but um, raising, like metal smithing, so raising vessels from a flat sheet. And okay. I don't know, when I took that class in particular, I was just like, this is the coolest thing ever, that I could go from this flat medium, this flat material, and I could just, sky's the limit, I could make it completely vertical. It, it takes a lot of work, but <laughs> do it. And I don't know, it was just, it, it felt like something had clicked when I was working with that, that I played around with a lot of other materials, but I never really felt that. You feel passionate about uh, working I, with metal. I, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And now no more sculptor sculpturing or you My, still do woodworking. I, I yeah. Yeah. I, I do woodworking as a as a kind of random almost therapeutic thing sometimes, but it's it's a step back because I think I struggle a lot with metals still. Yeah. So there's a there's a push and a pull with metals that because of my nature to I like I am really good at beating a dead horse, I guess. So I just keep <laughs> something may not be working out, but I keep fighting with it. Mm -hmm. And so so with wood, it feels like it comes easier most times, but and it's it's also more accessible to me. OK, but it's I don't know. It's just not the same as as working with metal and, and being able to sort a whole set of pieces together. And I mean, I can go really sculptural with my metal work too. So yes. I feel like there's, there's a lot of flexibility with the metal that I don't necessarily get with the wood or I'm not capable of doing with the wood. Yeah. Um, if you have just uh, tuned in, um, if you have any questions for us, uh, please put it in the comments section and we will get to that later. Uh, I'm Marike Visser. I'm from Suriname. And this is Gabrielle Wilkes and she's from Trinidad and Tobago. Gabrielle, um, you were also the recipient of the prestigious Dean's Scholarship an Aspire student grant and a scholarship to study abroad in Italy. You went to Italy, 
I think last year. Last year, yeah. Okay. Tell us about that experience and in what way that differed from your stay in Indiana in the States. That entire Italy experience was just surreal. I it took a lot to get me there and and a scholarship. This is scholarship is what gets me everywhere it seems. But I, I mean, the days leading up, like even when I was packing my suitcase, I couldn't believe it. When I was there, I couldn't believe that I was actually there. I sit down and look at the pictures sometimes and I'm still in denial. I was just like, that that wasn't a really vivid dream or anything. You know, I, I was actually I was actually in Italy. But um, it was a school trip. So the School of Art hosted that trip that every other year they will get a group and go to Italy and it is a summer session. So I took a painting class and um, an art history. So we started in Venice and we ended in Rome because we visited a couple of cities while we were there. And it, I mean, it was kind of stressful in a lot of ways because it was this jam packed days. I mean, the teachers went above and beyond to really let us see as much as we could possibly see which it, it was exhausting because I mean, we were getting our 10, we were getting 10,000 plus steps in every day. <laughs> it was just, I, I think I was at my peak fitness at that point with how much walking that we were doing. Wow. And we were just seeing so much and so many frescoes, so many paintings. I'm, I'm not a 2D person myself, but I mean, I have eyes and I can appreciate the, the intricacy of all of that. and. Florence was my favorite city, actually, because that was the first time that I saw a lot of metalwork in the um, Bargello Museum. Mm -hmm. But it was, I mean, surreal is really the, the first word that comes to mind when I think about it. I, I hope I get to go back one day. Yes. But, um, we had gone to the Venice Biennale and I found out afterwards, I was really upset that there was a metal smith who was present, like somebody had their work up, but the Annale is huge and yeah. <laughs> it's not physically possible to do it in one day. And I got lost, of course, because we would just go our separate ways when we got into places and we knew that we needed to meet at a certain spot. I got hopelessly lost in there though, and I could not find, for the life of me, I could not find that section, but I, I saw, so many other things that were equally incredible. Something that when I was listening to Katrina's talk earlier, one of her pieces kind of looks like it actually. I don't know the name of the artist, but but it was just, it was amazing seeing this talent from all over the world in all these different media, things that maybe I could potentially make, but at the same time, just like, wow, I would have thought to do to do anything like that. And it was very different from the rest of what we had been seeing so far because this was contemporary work specifically too. Mm -hmm. So your stay in Italy was more about uh, seeing other arts. Yeah. And, and I mean, we, not we did, we did, we had yeah. like, we had our sketchbooks and we had, because it was a class at the end of the day too. Mm -hmm. We had to manage doing that work, but um, because of how it was set up, a lot of work happened before and after the trip. So you kind of do whatever you could in between. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've finished walking around the chapel or something, you might sit down and do a quick sketch. We had, we had stayed at an art school called La Romita and that was in the countryside. So it's just this sprawling, you know, green and just beautiful. And it was the first, the first break kind of that we had on that whole trip because we were there for 14 days. So it's kind of like, that was the first place that we stayed in for so long. So it was like a breather because everything else was five days here or four days here. And you're just you're moving, you're constantly moving. And La Romita, we had a studio, so it's like, okay, you could sit down, you have a desk, you can work, you have a wall, you could pin up your paintings, and it was incredible. Yes. <laughs> I hope I can go back when COVID's done. I hope so. <laughs> and uh, 
um, how was it in, in the States? Did you see other work also? Of course, not in, in such, a, such an abundance, but... Yeah, I, for me in the States, I didn't, I didn't necessarily get out from campus too much. So we had, we had a museum, the school has a museum. So I've been to the museum and I mean, there's incredible works there too. And we would have field trips with some classes. So I did go to Chicago and I went to the Art Institute and the MoMA. But I mean, I got lost in those ones too, because I have a terrible sense of direction. So I guess I get lost everywhere I go. <laughs> but for the most part, I mean, it would it couldn't scratch the surface of, of Italy because that was an entire trip just dedicated to that. And yeah. while I was at school, I think I was always very focused on what I was doing. So I mean, on my own time, I may not necessarily get out to, to look at other things because I'm just seeing, I have this assignment to do or this and that. So I always felt like I had other things that were yeah. at the forefront of my mind. But I mean, I would go to the, the student shows because that's in the same building as my classes. So I don't have to go very far to, yeah. to see other student artwork. Of course. Of all uh, the participants in the Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salons, you have been affected by the pandemic in a very harsh way. You had to decide to return home in just a few hours time and still you managed to graduate cum laude. Uh, <laughs> very, I... very good. But tell us about a bit about how, how that went. All throughout last semester, honestly, my dad had been warning me about COVID. He, uh -huh. We would call every week and my brother was supposed to go to China to work. So my dad was there, we were talking about it from the standpoint of my brother and we're just like, uh -huh. we're seeing this thing and, and this doesn't look good, this doesn't look good. But I mean, it was just in China, but the nature of global travel and all of that it's very easy to see that this could this could go this could spread fast yes uh so we were watching it for a long time before it became an issue but i mean i felt like i was in a bubble at school so we were just mm -hmm. we were still going day to day as usual and then i think it was after spring break it was in my mind when we came back from spring break because people went away so people going all over the states or some people might have left the country Mm -hmm. during spring break and I remember standing in a class and somebody had gone to New York and New York had it at that point it had reached New York and I was watching her so suspiciously like I I, I actually moved further away from her because I was just like is anybody thinking about this COVID thing and the fact that everybody just went off on spring break and people are going to bring this our bubble is no longer a thing and I think a day or two afterwards, a, a teacher had called us in to announce that they would be closing campus. But um, what they had told us is like, okay, campus is going to close, but for the seniors and anybody who's supposed to be graduating, and particularly the art faculty, I mean, we need we need to have studio access because how are we going to make things if we can't get into yes. classes? So they had allowed us access, but we weren't meeting with our teachers anymore. So the seniors, we just all knew, we were like, okay, we know what we're about. We don't necessarily need our teacher here with us. So we were just day in, day out, we were living in our, in our studios. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was working in glass and metal studio trying to finish things. So glass is like 15 minutes away from that building. So I was just, I would walk to glass, finish my work there, walk to Metals. I mean, I had my lunch kit. I was ready to just camp out in the studio for the day. Mm -hmm. And for an entire week, that was what all of us were doing. We were just nonstop. You come really early, you leave probably in the morning, the following morning, and it was just repeating that. And I think it was Friday night something i was i was trying really frantically to finish my piece my the duen rattle 
I was just like, I need to get this all sorted because I don't have a good feeling about how this is going yes. and and I need to be organized as much as possible. And that was one of the big things that I needed to be in studio for. So Can I had done it. Can we see that one again? Because, well. <laughs> you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know yeah, from looking at it. <laughs> why, you, why you didn't include the glass anymore. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so my that time. Was on Friday, you were busy, so, busy yeah. with. Friday, I was soldering all that vine onto the the rattle form mm -hmm. and then as soon as i finished it i i just had this feeling like i needed to pack up my bench because i had all my belongings i i mean i leave them in my locker and on my bench uh -huh. so i had this strong feeling that i needed to start organizing my stuff now and i was like i'll just kind of leave the main things that i need that could stay but i'll pack everything else away so yeah. my friend and I had stayed really late that night. The two of us were packing up our benches and I left and wake up the following morning. I was moving a little later than usual that day. I was in the kitchen making breakfast and I get a call from my mom and she was so, she was so frantic and she's, that's not her. And she's just like, Gabby, Gabby, I need to speak to auntie. I need to speak to auntie because I was living with a family. And I was just kind of like, well, what is what is going on? Is somebody hurt? Is somebody sick? And she was like, they're closing the borders. And I mean, I I was just kind of dumbstruck. And I yes. I handed off the phone and I sat down and I immediately started crying because I was just like, I am not prepared. I, I don't know how to cope with this. I don't know what to do. And because I had gotten a ticket, like I spoke to my teacher about this whole thing and at a point, I think I did actually want to leave that weekend. And she was saying, actually, no, I don't think it was that weekend. I think it was the Monday I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And she was asking me if there's any chance that I could put it off a little bit just to make sure that I finished my pieces yes. and then go. But um, so I had a ticket for Wednesday. I was supposed to leave the Wednesday. So Saturday morning, my mom is freaking out. I'm crying. And she's talking to auntie. And she was just like, after she hung up the call, she was like, okay, don't worry. We're going to take you to the airport. So just just go online, see what you, if you could buy a ticket. And we'll, don't worry. She was like, I will I'll drive you to the airport. If you get stranded in Miami, I will drive to Miami and pick you up. Like she was going above and beyond to, yeah. to facilitate this whole thing. So I sat down. I purchased another ticket to leave. And that ticket was in a couple of hours. So then... I had to grab a suitcase. I never packed a suitcase so fast in my entire life because I pack really slowly normally. But I, I just literally threw things in. Nothing was folded. I was just throwing clothes all over the place. And then, of course, I needed to pack my thesis. So I had to get a second suitcase and very lovingly bubble wrap everything and put clothes bunched up all over it because I was just like, if anything breaks, you know, I don't know what I will do if any of my pieces break. Yes. And, you know, I packed up my suitcases. I headed back to studio to collect the rest of my things. I think I had seen, like, one friend. We started crying as we were just, like, hugging because it was just like, oh, my God, you know, I, I didn't think this was how I was going to leave. And just hastily got rid of, you know, I just moved everything out of studio. One of my friends had to take some of my other things for me because I didn't get to see her. So she just, she took all my glass pieces for me. And and yeah, the next thing I knew, I was, I was in a car on my way to the airport. I spent the night in Miami on the floor that, because okay. I, I don't sleep. If I travel by myself, I don't sleep. So I was just fighting sleep that night sitting down on the floor, watching movies on my phone, and, and praying, praying so much that the flight doesn't get canceled because they canceled mm -hmm. a lot of flights. And I, I happened to get in on one of the ones, so 20, the 22nd of March was when the borders closed, and that was the day that I made it back home. And, wow. <laughs> yeah. And then you were just in time for the lockdown. And I was just in time to be put yeah. in quarantine and just not leave <laughs> okay we'll we'll get back to that point uh i want to ask for uh, people who have uh, just uh, joined us uh this is 
uh, Marike Visser. And uh, our artist is Gabrielle Wilkes from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, if you have any questions for us, please don't hesitate and put them in the comments section and we will get uh, to that in a few minutes. Gabrielle, um, you were just in time for the lockdown. Yeah. This was in March. Mm -hmm. And then now here you are, you are graduated so well and and now your artist's career so can yeah. start. <laughs> yeah. But Bye. COVID spoiled it even more for you because all of your equipment is still in the United States. Yes, it is. How, 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 is, how does your daily practice look now? Looks like now. I have been doing printmaking because mm -hmm. I, I did have the presence of mind to pack that that much in my equipment because it's small. Okay. So it was easy to take that. And, and I mean, I love printmaking too. So that's kind of, at first I was just playing around with different material, trying to see what, what else can I work with that maybe I can start there and then when I get my equipment, I can just take it a step further. But I kind of, I was on pause with that and I would start and then I was just like, this isn't working the way I want it to work or I can't see how it's gonna end because I, I don't have the equipment to do what I'm imagining to do. Mm -hmm. So then can, I was very much into prints. Can we see a, a print you have been making um, for, for uh, you have been making a print which is a portrait of your of a very important person in your life, yes. yeah, and also a very important person for your art. Uh, this is your father, it and is. it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful print. Mm -hmm. um, so that's. Um, you were in time for the lockdown, but you were also home. Yeah. So I, I think in the end, it was a good decision to to return. It, yeah, I have no regrets about that. It was it was stressful, but I'm I'm really glad that I, I made it back, especially considering what's happening with other people who couldn't get home. Yes. But my dad has he's always been someone that. He has a lot of ideas because he's pretty artistic himself. So I think he was always an inspiration from that point. And I think he's an, a fun thing of like a fun subject to draw because of the wrinkles on his face, because my dad's 78. So I always thought, oh, this is fun to just to get deep wrinkles. His eyes are really deep set. And I, I just love using him as a subject matter. And he was a big inspiration for my thesis too, because somebody painted him as the traditional character, the focal character, Papa Boa. So the, the next picture is the piece that I made when I came home, because I had to rework an entire piece, yeah, that one. I had to redo a whole piece because I couldn't finish what I was trying to do in the States. And now I was home with no equipment. And he had this walking stick that, I mean, I wanted to use the stick from the beginning and we were just like, there's no way he could mail this to me. He's gonna have to cut it or something like that and we don't wanna do that. And I mean, suddenly I was home and I was just like, okay, this this is the thing that I wanted anyway. And so I I sat there and I, I Viking knit the entire stick. So you can see the little copper wires going across it. And I made this You actually, you actually knit it with your hands. Yeah, uh, so I knit a, a wire, wire, a wire net for yeah. for the whole stick. I did. It took and, a long time. <laughs> and at the top of the stick, uh, there is a, also a a, a bird's net. Or, yeah, it looks uh, like a net. That I was inspired by the corn bird's nest. So. I got a coconut, cut that in half, and my dad had another old walking stick that we sliced in sections to make 
be uh -huh. to just make the rest of it. And then there was an old bird's nest in the roof. So I actually took a bird's nest too and I, I lined the inside of it with the nest. So it's like my dad's Rafiki stick now. Okay. As far as I think. <laughs> Does he like it? He loves it. Every time somebody comes by and he has to talk about my art, he will run inside the house, he will grab the stick. Okay. It's, it's like Great. my showpiece for him now. Great. And how, uh, how is it? Do you interact with other artists in Trinidad? Not yet. I, I have a lot of plans too, but I, I would like the freedom to actually meet with them in person so i'm kind of i'm waiting but at the same time i have people in mind like old classmates from secondary school that they've yeah. also gone on to pursue art because i'm trying to prepare myself for being able to have exhibitions and that kind of stuff so there are people that i'd like to talk to and collaborate with potentially is your lockdown still very strict? At They're the loosening moment? up restrictions. We started loosening up restrictions, but I mean, both my parents are older. There's been a lot of personal struggles going on lately too. Yeah. So it it hasn't been. Unfortunately, it just hasn't been a priority right now. No. Okay. And what, what are your other plans for the future? You are now busy, busy with the printmaking. Um, do you have any plans for um, collaborating in other online projects? Or um... I am going to keep my eye out for things because I think if I can find more opportunities, then that's also going to help keep me motivated to keep working because sometimes I I have bad habits and I might get into my head too much about what I'm doing yes. and I that just makes me do nothing. I just paralyze myself instead. So I am I am going to keep looking out because a teacher's a teacher actually put me onto the catapult program and I'm so grateful to him. Okay. So thank you, Brent, that's, if you're watching. That's great. Yeah, uh, that's, that's wonderful. See, the network is growing and it's working. It is. I like this. There's so many people that I didn't know about in within the country, within the region. So it's it's really exciting to see that there are just so many options for other people to potentially work with. Yes. Um, are you ready to uh, go to the first question from the audience? It is from Art and Soul Art Gallery Bookstore. Thank you for sending in a question. Do you aspire to have your work shown at the Biennale in Venice one day? That would be a dream come true. <laughs> because I can't remember the name of the section. It's like the pavilions, I think, where you very specifically get separated by countries. And there was actually one for Venezuela, because Venezuela, I think, was the only the only one in the region that had been there, but unfortunately, because of all the unrest in Venezuela, they didn't have their, the, you just saw the pavilion with their name on it, but there was a little piece of paper tacked on saying that unfortunately, they won't be participating. So I think it would be incredible if, you know, Trinidad could have a pavilion or, or if the Caribbean decided that they wanted to work together and people cool collaborated and yeah. yeah that we represent because i think it would be fantastic if we could be represented on that stage yes that would be wonderful so great question um do we have another question from annalee davis how was the transition between uh, how was the transition been from the supportive environment of the academy to working independently in Trinidad? And do you feel you are now part of a local arts community? I would not say I'm part of the no. community at, at all. 
I, wow. that's, that's something I need to, that I aspire to be. I would like to, to communicate more with others and find myself more part of the community. And up there, yeah, up there, I, I mean, I had a lot more support in the States because I had my friends who were in the major too and we would all push each other or we'd be bouncing ideas back and forth. So I do, I would like to find people that I can do that with here. I just, I have a lot of supportive friends here that they're not necessarily a part of the arts community, but they're telling me about galleries or they, they're putting me on to potential opportunities. Or like your teacher. Yeah. Oh yeah, like my teacher. Yeah. yeah. Now, as you explained to me earlier that your personal circumstances make it difficult to you have to um, be very careful because you don't want to uh, spread COVID yeah. uh, to, like, uh, to your parents. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's why an initiative as this one is is so important. Mm -hmm. And uh, I already said it in the in the former conversation, but. <clears throat> Social media is, is is really a blessing in these it times. Is. Yes. I just need to work on being better about it because I'm not very good at putting myself out there most times. So being a part of this is yes. like turning over a new leaf for me. Yeah. But I am I'm working on the social media thing in particular. Okay. It's, it's free exposure. So we have another question. So um uh please show us the question oh it's from kendall hippolyte uh i see you were bo born in saint lucia though your upbringing was in trinidad have you ever felt any artistic curiosity about saint lucia i i mean i left saint lucia when i was like two years old so i didn't have any kind of connection there but i would be i've gone like i've visited since i've been older i've never actually seen anything art related in those visits those visits were very much you know go to gropiton or go to the beach but i would be interested now especially as i'm through catapult you know i'm learning about all these other artists so i would love to to go see firsthand and since it's in the region, you know, it's a lot more feasible to go to St. Lucia than it is to go to the States or something like that. So okay. I would be interested. Yes, it would be wonderful to when we can travel again. Yeah. We can go places. Well, I was wondering, um, you now have done your bachelor's. Yes. And do you want to go for your master's? I never saw myself as getting an MFA before because I used to think that I was delaying the a double. I was like, if I go for an MFA, that's me trying to put off being a practicing artist in the real world. Mm -hmm. But I mean, since going through my BFA coming towards the end, I was changing my mind on that more mm -hmm. and, and seeing it more as an opportunity to, to learn, you know, just to keep learning and to have yes. A, a specific community that you can bounce your ideas off of and get feedback from. So I would like to do an MFA. I'm just not sure where I would do it because mm -hmm. everything that's happening in the States now, it, you know, it's very unsettling. And I got out four years with, without incidents, you know, I mm -hmm. never had any overtly racist problem or anything like that. And I have concerns that if I go back, I might, I might see that side and I don't want to. And it would also just be amazing to go to see somewhere else. You know, I mean, I know all the states are pretty different, so I could just go to a different state. Yes. But I mean, I went to Italy and, and there's a school in Florence. There is a, a jewelry school. So I was just like, imagine if I could go somewhere like that instead. Yes. Would be wonderful. Um, we have another question from Denise Robinson. COVID has pushed many of us creatives to be creative. As we say in Jamaica, 
level up. How are you navigating this challenge? I actually, when I had first gotten back and I was in, I was in quarantine, like this was a government mandated quarantine. I signed a contract saying that I would be quarantined for two weeks because I mm -hmm. traveled. And during that, I had been doing self portraits because I mean, that I was by myself <laughs> all the time. So I was kind of doing the self portrait series. So I think for me, it, it's pushing me to explore other mediums that I wouldn't necessarily have been focused on as much. Mm -hmm. because I, I've done watercolors and that kind of thing, but that's, I don't think of myself as a painter, but since COVID happened and I feel like I'm always having to just think of what, what can I do with what I have in front of me now? So I did experiments with fabric and sewing so I think it's it's pushing me to, to experiment more. Yes. To so just take advantage of whatever is close at hand. And I feel, uh, personally, I feel that what you did with the uh, knitting with your hands, with the metal uh, thread, I, I just love it. It's very mm -hmm. inventive to think of. And, it, and it's beautiful results, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, do we have another question? From Author Girl, thank you. Your work has a very strong familial connection, which must make it very personal for you. Does this ever create situations where you feel conflicted or unsure about broaching certain topics? I because I, I talk to my family a lot, like anytime I have an idea, nine times out of ten, I'm gonna say something to them before I do it. And we're bouncing it back off of each other and mm -hmm. refining the idea and that kind of stuff. So that that aspect of my process allows me to kind of navigate that potential problem. So like I've spoken to my brother about things that I've thought about and I'd be like, well, is this too is this too personal and it's too much of you? for me to do it? Is it a problem if I'm depicting your story like that or something? And so far, I haven't had any problems because but just it's open communication that we have with each other to work through it. So I actually got an idea earlier today about something that would be very personal <laughs> if I'm to explore, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about it at the same time. Yes. But your family, uh, they are all creative persons. In, in different ways. Well, in different yeah, ways, in but different uh, ways. so that helps, I think. It, yeah, it does. Because like my brother, he did a theater degree. So he's accustomed to talking about these kinds of things too. Yes. My dad writes. Like, it's, I feel like we're all very comfortable with but being open about that kind of stuff. So it hasn't been a problem so far. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think uh, we are nearing the end. I want to know uh, one more thing. You told me your mother said you could go away, but don't lose the accent. <laughs> it was very important <laughs> that I do it. I don't know if other Caribbean people do it as much, but Trinis kind of have a bad habit of we go away and we pick up the accent of wherever so we've gone. Many people too. Okay. Because my mom always used to say she studied in Jamaica and she'd be like, You don't hear Jamaicans doing that. They keep their accent, you know, they are proud of their accent. So why aren't we proud of ours? And why why do we go, you know, you go away and you have to come back speaking like an American. So so she threatened, she threatened me, she threatened my brother, and she was just like, don't come back in my house talking like an American. So I hope, I mean, I hope I didn't. I I don't think you do, but then Great. again, I'm not from Trinidad. So. That's true. <laughs> but it sounds right to me. Great. Thank you so much for Thank this you. conversation. I loved it. And I'm, I'm hoping, uh, 
I will see and hear a lot more of you and of your work. And um, yes, we have come to the end. And uh, thanks again, Gabrielle. Please remember to tune in again at, um, I'm sorry, I have the wrong, yes. To tune in again next Tuesday. And uh, I'm very sorry. In closing Thank today's time, <laughs> I'd like to express huge thanks to the Catapult Partners, including the American Friends of Jamaica, Kingston Creative, and Fresh Milk for making this series of salons happen. And please remember to join us for the next Catapult Lockdown Virtual Salon at 1 p.m. AST on Tuesday, November 3rd with Tony Battle Bennett from the Bahamas, who will be in dialogue with Lisandro Surio from St. Martin. And again at 4 p.m. when we will, he will speak with Mariana Tonia Odoñez from Puerto Rico. And please remember to subscribe to the Fresh Milk YouTube sh channel where, where you can watch all previous LVS sessions and be notified of upcoming live streams. It's very worthwhile to watch them all. Um, thank you again, Gabriella. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, Catapult and partners for doing this. Goodbye. Hi.